I say it humbly, but it's a very unusual book. And although it's my story, I sort of found it unusual when I read it. Who's it written for? You know, um, villains, addicts, um, broken people, you know, all ranges of people that are broken. People who are frightened to reveal their inner truths. There's so much else in there about crime, about relationships, uh, it's betrayal, dysfunction, poverty, wealth, um, prisons, uh, big crimes. There's enjoyment for a, a number of different people in there, I believe. And I just pray that we, that people have hope that they can change the future if there's been a number of sort of dysfunctional situations in their own uh, forefathers. I've got few in mind. Hello everybody. I'm so pleased to please you here. Thanks for coming. Um, we're doing another one of these events just to relaunch the book and keep moving forward and to let it organically grow so you can see the story and follow the journey. Um, today we have a, a lovely guest with us today, a little bit different from the last two, um, is Jonathan Aiking, um, a very dear friend, good brother, been very helpful to me in the past. And we have lovely Hattie who wrote the book. And um, she's going to be sort of taking over today, Hattie, aren't you? I am, yes. Well, bless you, Hattie. There you go. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, so, yes, I'm Harriet Compton. I co-wrote Sins of Fathers with Michael. And it's great to be here live. As I'm sure you can imagine, it's been the most incredible 18 months working with Michael. And I'm so excited to be delving deeper into Michael's life today. Um, Jonathan, it would be great if you could just introduce yourself, if possible. Well, I'm like a cat who has had about nine lives. <clears throat> um, I am most um, notorious for being uh, a prisoner, a cabinet minister who was jailed 21 years ago for 18 months for perjury. Um, but I actually did quite a few things before that. I was um, <clears throat> started out life trying to be a lawyer, read law at Oxford, um, then went to journalism rather excitingly, was a war correspondent in Vietnam, then I was in business and banking, and I got into the House of Commons. I was in the House of Commons for 24 years. I had some very good jobs as a minister. I was a defence minister in charge of our nuclear weapons, what it was worth. I was um, then in the cabinet as chief secretary to the treasury. And then um, something really made my ego swell, my head swell. People started to write about me saying, I was a future Prime Minister. I should quickly say that is not an exclusive title. Um, you could fill many a football stadium with uh, MPs who've been told they're going to be Prime Minister one day. <clears throat> anyway, it went to my head a bit and I started to get even more arrogant than I already was. Uh, told some lies in a complicated libel case, got caught, got prosecuted for perjury, pleaded guilty and went to jail. Um, <clears throat> prison was actually, for me, not a great negative experience. I can't say I enjoyed it, but on the other hand, I saw a richness of life that I would never otherwise have seen. And when I came out of prison, I always wanted to do something worthwhile again. <clears throat> and politics, for all its fault, does give you a chance to do worthwhile things for other people. Um, my first move, rather strange, was to go to the one place in Britain which had worse food than a prison and more uncomfortable breads than a prison. And I did a longer sentence there than I had done in prison. I spent two years, two and a half years, studying theology at an Anglican theology college called Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. Very fine place. It taught me a lot. Um, and then about 15 years went by and I didn't know quite what to do, but nagging away with me is the thought that I or to do something of service to the God I had so strongly and did so strongly believe in. And then three or four years ago, I became a prison chaplain. And that's what I do now. I'm a prison chaplain at Pentonville. And um, I find it's a very useful qualification. Um, once people there in Pentonville believe that uh, this uh, strange guy in a dog collar actually was a prisoner before, <laughs> uh, we get mm. better and better and communicate very, very well. And 
God and the Holy Spirit do the work rather than me, but I love prison ministry <laughs> and what I do there, and it's a great calling, and I'm very, very happy as a prison chaplain. It's the best job mm. of my life. Anyway, that's Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Bless Thanks, you. Jonathan. Um, so, Michael, do you remember the first time you met Jonathan? Well, the first time I met Jonathan in person, what I don't think you would remember is it was prior his prison uh, sentence and you was in um, HTB and, and I, you, in fact, you were sitting opposite me and um, I was pretty impressed with who you was actually. Um, and then I, we, we got acquainted afterwards. Um, I suppose the, the, the common denominator was we, we both done a bit of bird. Really sort of respected your sort of um, take on prisons. I, I respected that you was a, you know, you, you've done your time very well uh, and, and you took from prison like I did. You, 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 I took a faith on board from the Nick. So I've always enjoyed your company. I want to say thanks for what you wrote in the book as well. Uh, but that was the first time I met Jonathan. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. And Jonathan, do you remember when you first met Michael? I do. His memory is pretty good. I think we were at some sort of um, a gathering, uh, which um, Michael was sort of senior villain, um, <clears throat> done the longest sentence of anybody. There were a few others. <laughs> and there was some, actually, I mean, Michael and I have, I mean, two or three very strong bonds. I mean, first, obviously, we've done our bird, and that it does bring you into sort of a fraternity of people who know what they're talking about in prison. Secondly, we both of us either found or massively deepened our faith in prison. And a fair amount of people do that, but not that many, but some do. But the biggest thing of all is having done those two things, and this is the biggest bond, then to go and want to tell people about it afterwards and tell people about it in a um, way that I think makes um, the, Michael's book is called The Sins of the Fathers, uh, and it's a great title for a great book. But the question really is, uh, most of us commit some sort of sins, quite bad ones too. Um, and what do we do after it, if we've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ? Do we then really roll up our sleeves and get working for him? And I think that's what Michael and I both do. Um, I always think that whenever we do a double act together, he's far better than me. Um, I may have a few <laughs> jokes, but he's got the much raw and better vitality as a speaker, uh, which comes across in the book very, very well. You know, this is, by the way, a terrific book. I wrote the foreword of it, uh, and I'm very proud to have done so. And uh, most forwards say nice things about the book, but um, I really said something, one or two things I felt passionately about. First of all, it's a brilliantly told story. Um, I think in the opening paragraph, I could say, this is a mighty rushing cataract of an autobiography. <laughs> and it surely is. Um, the, um, uh, I think uh, Hattie deserves enormous credit for getting the cataract under control into the, uh, <laughs> the page. And um, but, uh, it's uh, wonderful stories. And not quite the bits I expected to be the great stories, but Michael's um, story of growing up in, on a council estate in South London with lots of villainy going on around him. His father was a fairly bad kleptomaniac. He had all kinds of problems, which he tells about in vivid detail. He had a sort of friend of the family who came and abused him. A uh, very rough time, but um, this whole rather wonderful world of subculture of South London council states villains. Um, I think I said in my forward that uh, you know Michael told it as well as Samuel Pepys told things in his diary. Uh, and there's, I think there's ever been such a good writer about council estate crime. Uh, <laughs> it's just you, you, the things they say about it can't turn the page, the page turner, um, can't put it down. Uh, those old cliches actually are true of this book. I couldn't praise it more highly. Oh, wow. Thank, Thank you, you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Michael, why do you feel Sins of Fathers is so relevant to you today? 
I think why it's relevant, and I'm not trying to sell it, I suppose I am. It's irrelevant because it, there's a chance for mm. however broken we are, however crazy we are, um, there's a chance to get through it. Uh, I'm living proof that you can change. I'm living, and it's not because I'm, I ain't had a drink for 21 years. Mm. There's certain things that I don't do no more. There's certain things that I don't even think about no more. So what it says on the tin has become apparent for me. Mm. Uh, and I just pray that people give themselves a chance. Mm. And, I, and I think it's what we, we got to receive something. And it's not a pat on the back or a million pound in your bank. They're fantastic. Nothing against that. But I think it's that belief. That the Bible says this, where two or more are gathered, and I'm sorry if this is a bit too much for anyone, but where two or more are gathered in his name, the presence is there. You know, and we look up in the heavens. I've said it a number of times. And there's a miracle going on that we spin around in orbit. I mean, how about that one? And yet we're frightened to believe that that power that's activated in all our lives, the air that we breathe, the way we are, can come into us and change the way we feel. So knowing, and now going right back to um, the time you were in prison, and you were um, sentenced to 12 and a half years in 1994 for importing cannabis. So yeah. I'm told. <laughs> and then you were also um, in prison with your dad and you shared a cell. Can you just tell us a bit about what life is like inside? God, dear, how long have you got? <laughs> OK, I suppose we arrived in Exeter prison. He blamed me. He told me I was a greedy bee. I never stopped. I should have slowed it down. So I, I, I blew his cover, bless him. Oh, he's a cracker, my dad. Mm. I was as mad as he was. Uh, and bless his heart, he had a heart of gold. So when we arrive in the Nick down in Exeter, there's all sort of madness going on. There's all guns and all this sort of thing that you watch on the TV. And then we arrive in prison. Uh, you know, I wasn't meant to arrive in prison. I was meant to get away with it and get a nice few quid out of it. Uh, but that never took place. But my life ended there, my, my old life, my new life began. Uh, and I suppose when I walked into the prison, this, this big opposite that was in me, I was frightened of a mouse but wasn't frightened of being arrested with a gun. You know, it, there was no equilibrium. I, you know, I, there was a man, Jonathan said he's lived nine lives. Well, so have I, 99, I feel. And my apologies if anyone's listening who suffered over it, but I've always loved you all. But when I went into the Nick with my dad, the, as I turned the radio on in the cell, the, the song that come on was, this is the road to hell, Chris Rea. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't. It was the road to salvation and peace for us. The reality was we have to go to hell to get to our heaven. We have to be broken to be mended. And, in, and, and, and although we're broken, you know, we, we seem to put so many things over the top of it. Money, mm -hmm. sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever you do. And so when I was in this place, captivated in this little cell, you know, 48 hours prior to that, I was counting the money. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know... You, you, some of the things in prison, which you think are bad, are good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so you learn to know yourself, you learn mm -hmm. to be with yourself. And, um, you know, amazing things happened for yeah. me. I wish it had happened somewhere else, but they happened in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I suppose I found this a part of my journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm still on it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still on it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, Jonathan, what was life like for you inside? Obviously, very different from what you were used to. Well, of course, I had my <clears throat> down moments and my mm. difficult moments. But if I stand back and say, what was the big picture? Uh, my life in prison was one of great gain. Uh, there were, was pain as well, but there was great gain. What was the great gain? Well, one place where I connect strongly with Michael is that suddenly, you know, you do feel when you're in one of those tiny little cells <clears throat> and you've had a life of glamour and uh, excitement and freedom outside it, you really have sort of hit rock bottom uh, and realize that, that your life as you knew it was over, <clears throat> the future is extremely bleak. I think it was Luther who said it is in our pain and in our brokenness that we can come closest to Christ, but you have to let him come as well. You can't just sit there and wait, you have to learn to pray. And that was very much part of my journey. And I got into a prayer group. Um, so looking back on it, I, I felt there were many more positives than negatives in prison. But I went through the same 
sort of gloomy moments that Michael was just describing. <clears throat> One minute you're counting the money, or in my case, counting the votes, uh, and, and um, <laughs> counting the red boxes and cabinet appointments, <laughs> they are in itself, uh, and it's all yeah. over. So mm -hmm. recovering from that, I think you do it infinitely better if you uh, have some help from God. I sometimes say I got through it with my three Fs, um, friends, family, and faith. Uh, and mm. uh, at the end, the greatest of these was faith. <clears throat> but at the beginning, um, I was extraordinarily grateful to my family. I had three teenage children, and um, they, um, somewhat nervous, to put it mildly, visited me in HMP Belmarsh. <clears throat> where they couldn't believe the security precautions of things like having their gums searched and their clothes searched because they came into Britain's high security prison. Um, and um, then, of course, I had um, uh, friends, I had wonderful friends uh, who stood by me, encouraged me. Um, and finally, the discovery of faith, which is not a quick fix, incidentally, and nor was it for Michael. I uh, read the book carefully. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> he mm. relapsed, he rebelled, he went backwards. Mm. The same was true uh, to me, perhaps slightly less dramatically, but uh, <clears throat> still the same. Uh, but people stick with you uh, and uh, mm. keep going with you on the journey, and they are incredibly important. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, and Michael, how about you? How did you get through prison? You know, I had the support of my children, my, my family, Tracy, my friends. You know, I didn't want for anything, but I wanted for everything. You know, I had, I had money, I had, I had everything I needed, but I didn't have Michael. Uh, and, and so it was sometimes hard for me to cope. And um, eventually, uh, the freedom that I found was finding something that was um, very, very powerful in my life. Mm. And, and you had to hit me with a big fix to convince me because I weren't having it. Um, and, and I wasn't having it. I just thought, you know, I went along to the church, but something incredible happened and it, it didn't make it any easier, but it, it sort of made it, there was a purpose. Yeah, and I thought, my God, this is real. Mm, yeah. and, and, and I'm not trying to convert anyone here at all. But the reality of it was, mm -hmm. it was real. I stopped using drugs. Um, I stopped doing all sorts of things. And one thing that I really used to love doing, mm -hmm. uh, and that was investigating the life of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and I thought he was a warrior. I thought he was tough. You know, I didn't think he was a wuss. You know, he weren't, he weren't no mug, this geezer. Yeah. The way they killed him, he weren't a grass. He, he kept his mouth shut. He said, Father, they know what, not what they do. So I started to like his character. I didn't think it was tambourines and Easter and Christmas. There was something in this that appeared to me that this guy was tough. Mm. And, you know, he'd done miracles, whether you believe the miracles or not, that's up to you. But what happened to me was where I was dirty in my soul from brokenness, something touched me in the place. It was like Dynarod, mm. like an Alka-Seltzer. It touches the place other parts can't touch. And, you know, it says, seek, find, knock on the door, have a look. But people used to go, ah, I can't have all that Christian stuff. Mm -hmm. But the amount of tough guys who was on the landing, that you wouldn't want a right hand off them. When them cell doors close, there's that reality of, I don't care who you are, mm -hmm. the reality of pain and crying out, what mm -hmm. am I doing here? Was it a way for me to get out of prison? Not really. It was a way for me to change mm -hmm. and there's hope in it for me anyway mm -hmm. so that's it love brilliant thank you cheers darling um, she's fantastic <laughs> by the way <laughs> it's mutual michael's fantastic yeah. um so we are now going to hear um a bit from sins of fathers here's a short video hold on my glass is there now it's becoming this is like the reality of this is war Reggie Cray and I become friends in Maidstone. We were doing the cleaning together. The Cray twins had always had a little bit of a smell about them. You could smell the badness in them. Reggie knew dad and Reggie's notoriety didn't impress me. I just saw a broken man. 
He was well defined and fit. He was now 60 odd, very small, and had declined after 30 years in jail. He was deaf as a post. Reggie's cell was like a Native American teepee with all sorts of Cherokee things. And he never used to sleep on his bed. He slept on the floor instead. Reggie would come out in the mornings wearing a yin yang. <laughs> he would come out in the morning wearing a yin yang nightgown with no pants on. I can't believe this. It's bloody real, isn't it? His, bro his boyfriend, Bradley Allardyce, his boyfriend, Bradley Allardyce, was just down from him from another cell. Sometimes inebriated, sometimes stoned, Reggie would call him and they'd go to the shower. Then Reggie would get on the phone. He was always on, on calls with B-list celebrities. He used to get the mail like a, they used to get mail like a Christmas sack, two sacks a day. They stamped the ones with the money inside, so he only, so he only opened those. There were too many others to read. He'd go, cool, I've got another hundred quid. He was once given £200,000 by someone who won the lottery. I would watch him scampering about his cell, his letters filling up after room. His fan club was incredible. Yeah? Is that okay? Great. Um, so, Jonathan, coming back to you, obviously the, um, the excerpt um, Michael has just read, um, it actually goes back to um, now, about 15 years ago, um, if not longer. Um, that what do you think is the relevance of the book today? Oh, crime is always with us and is relevant. But um, more interesting than I think the dramatic stuff in the book of um, daring do and fantastic criminal raids and smuggling things and what I think is really the book ultimately we're remembered for was not all the sort of grand uh, excitement bits, but the struggle towards changing a character. Now, I understand I had a bad character too. Um, and changing it, you have to work hard, you have to pray hard, you have to have people help you. But in the end, it's a mysterious outside force call it God, call it the Holy Spirit, but it's a road which we've been down many centuries before Michael and I went down it, yeah. Um, yeah. and some were in the uh, gospel stories. As a kid, he was a pretty bad criminal until he met Jesus, and everything changed. And it can change, it does change. And that's yeah. a very exciting, it's called, in, I think, the jargon, a journey of redemption. And what is that really? It's a journey of change, change for the better. Um, I don't think Michael and I would ever either just pat ourselves on the back and say, have we done well? Have we, haven't we been redeemed? Mm. It, if we have been redeemed, and I believe we both have, it's a gift uh, which we don't really deserve. Mm. It, it's a gift from God, but it does change. But I cannot imagine <coughs> anything I ever dreamt of throughout my entire life, for 10 years or more after going to Whitcliffe Hall, I cannot remember, I cannot imagine that I would ever be uh, dressed up in a dog collar, calling myself the Reverend, yeah. and being a prison mm. chaplain and a priest preaching sermon. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> to me, it's a miracle, mm. far beyond yeah, sort of winning the pools or the lottery. Um, mm. So, um, <laughs> mm. you know, who did that? Well, not me. Um, uh, yeah. and Michael too has changed uh, I think of myself as stumbling, falling, sinning backsliding I didn't yeah. sort of uh, and to this day I need support and prayer and so on uh, but uh, can you change you bet you can and you're looking at two people mm -hmm. who've done it but it's a gift from God not our work I'm actually just pressing a bit more into your um, prison chaplain work. Can you just tell us a bit more about this and what you what work you do in prisons? Well, I show up every morning. I'm on duty at Pentonville at about eight o'clock. And the first thing I have to do is to hear what's happened on the wings at, in, over the night, which may need some um, attention from a chaplain. <clears throat> For example, somebody may have attempted to commit suicide. Somebody may have done some self-harming. Um, 
somebody may have some very bad news has got to be broken to them. Their son has been killed in a motorcycle accident in Manchester. Or there may be some good news. Um, I mean, yesterday I brought a man some good news that his daughter, who'd been dangerously ill in hospital with COVID, had actually turned the corner and was breathing normally. And because of course, yeah. he couldn't communicate with the hospital. He was, uh, I was like a sort of, almost an angel messenger bringing him this good news. <clears throat> but then I have all um, the other people who have arrived in prison who are shattered to suddenly find themselves in prison. So mm. there's never a dull moment for a chaplain's life in prison. Mm. Uh, an awful lot of it, one of the things I always say is, um, first of all, um, I used to be a prisoner myself, so I understand what you're going through. And after some expressions of astonishment, um, it's fairly clear that I do know what I'm talking about when I talk about wings on Belmarsh or Elmley or whatever it was. And mm. so that builds a bond. And then I always say, can I pray for you? And a lot of these tough guys, <clears throat> or imaginary tough guys, don't exactly like the idea of prayer, but I always say, or for your family. And then almost nine times out of 10, they say, well, yes, now, I'd really like you to pray for my nan who's very ill, or actually my daughter's having a real problem at school. Could you pray for her? So I do an awful lot of praying in prison. Uh, how, how do you serve God? You sort of get the signals as you go along. You learn from other people. But the world of being a prison chaplain is really, really interesting, especially at the prison tough time. More interesting than any parish, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I love doing it. Mm, good. Um, thank you. And, and Michael, tell us about um, your prison work. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I mean, we started Alpha in, in prisons in, in, in the in the nineties, mm. and and so that sort of um, that went everywhere. It was um, you, you couldn't have run a company better than it if you wanted sort of bums on seats and people listening to having a chance to get out of their cell, their mindset, their pain. Mm. You know, I, I mean, the work that I do is I go into prisons. Um, you know, I I, I I don't know what you're meant to be. I'm just me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not mm. a vicar. Yeah. I sometimes swear, I still get angry sometimes, I still get the ump, but you know, it's changed. So I'm not looking for perfection, mm, so you know, I'm looking yeah. for this journey to keep changing me. So when I do the stuff in prisons, mm. it helps me. Yeah. And, um, you know, the pride, the ego, the low self-worth. And, and, and when you're in, when you're engaging with that, uh, and, and you become of assistant and, and you see something change and, and you're sharing the truth. You can't hit them with the Bible. Mm. I, I think it's attraction rather than promotion. Yeah. And I'm a work in progress. I ain't got it yet, but I'm on my way. Mm. You know, when I know something's good, I go for it. Yeah. Um, and so the work in prisons have been fantastic. Mm, uh, and it happens in the last story. There was a guy, he was in Uganda in the nick out there. He'd been sentenced to life in death. I was going to hang him or, 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 put, or execute the fella. And um, it's a true story. He, he was on death row for 25 stretch, 25 years. And he'd done alpha in prisons. And I met this geezer about five years ago. And I didn't know he'd done alpha in prisons. On the stage telling his story. And what happened? He'd done alpha in prisons. They took him out of death row. They released him from prison. And he's now a Uganda minister again working for prisons in Uganda. Now, if that ain't a miracle, if that ain't job satisfaction, if that ain't something good coming out of what we've tried to achieve, it brought tears to my eyes. You know, and, and they say, we only, like I said, you only keep, you only keep what you've got by giving it away. Mm. So if I can give a little bit of this away and I get something in return, my mind feels better. Yeah. I can tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not sleeping around. Yeah. I'm loving my family mm. uh, and I'm being kind to Michael. Yeah. So that's about it for mm -hmm. me. Brilliant. Darling. Thank you. Thank you. So we've now got lots of great questions from the audience. So Michael, um, did most of your friends in prison think that there was a spiritual side to life or did most just mock you? Well, <laughs> the lie is the lie. The mm. truth's the truth. So I think the second alpha course in Swal, the first official outer course in Swalside, 99 men done it. 
99 men and there was 500 con 500 inmates so 99 done it so there's proof of the puddings in the yeah. eating but but what happens is because christianity is mocked mm. no matter where you are it, 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 there's a mocking it was difficult yeah um but i do think that there was something about me that people it was street credibility maybe mm. that people started to investigate but listen there's mockers everywhere yeah. but if you keep going you know jesus got mocked all my friends spoke to me they go what you're going to church and i'd say yeah they might have thought it was an angle mm. but for me it was the truth yeah, yeah? Mm. so there was a lot of mocking went on but there was a lot of support there was a yeah, lot of love okay. there was tough guys come in and pray you know i'm talking mm. about proper people yeah. would you pray for my mum yeah i said of course but I never used to run up and down the wind with a Bible in me, eh? <laughs> mm. You know, I told you when I prayed for Reggie and he, he said I prayed and he, he could see. Yeah. And uh, he fell down the stairs when he took his glasses off. <laughs> so things like that was embarrassing. But yeah. bottom line, your answer is a lot of support. Mm -hmm. And I think the backbiting goes on everywhere. Yeah, Probably still today. Yeah, exactly. That's the way it is. How do you connect with prisoners? Well, a chaplain um, is not a prison officer and does a lot of useful work in terms of uh, welfare and uh, so on the whole chaplains are not sort of um, paid figures and they may be a bit not um, the last time I uh, gave a sermon in prison um, I haven't got through the first 10 words and some guy shouts gets out of the back and shouts um, not you again you always talk such epic <laughs> <problem."> <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and before I had a chance to come back, so to shout, um, let him try to talk his effing bollocks. Some of us want to hear it. <laughs> so, <laughs> take your opportunities. Um, and, you don't know what is what words are going to um, uh, he, people are going to hear and tune into. Um, mm. uh, and. So when I say, well, what makes people unravel, what people's turn, uh, they mm. hear something which gets them going. Uh, I do know mm. when you're in a prison, you have screwed up. You wouldn't be there if you hadn't screwed up. Mm. Uh, and that's a moment uh, of screwing up when you need to think, well, could I do better? Could I need to do better if I had the help of Jesus Christ? Uh, and the answer to that question for some people is a resounding yes. Other people prefer to pass by on the other side, go on mocking. It's their choice. Um, but I'm very glad that Mike and I have made the choices we have made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so now, Michael, over to you. So um, you've had some near-death experiences in your life. So many people are facing death or thinking about death in a new way because of COVID. What advice would you give to people about preparing to die well? I never became, a, I never found the faith because I wanted to stop being a criminal, you know. I, I, I looked for the faith because I didn't feel well. Mm. I mean it, you know, I had a story going on in my head. If you was in my head, you'd have gone crazy with me. <laughs> so is that near death? Mm. Um, you know, for me, my brother died in a terrible mm. car accident and I prayed that as the lorry went over him, he cried out to God. Mm. So to prepare ourselves in, in a situation like this, um, that, that, that's a funny question. But if you really want to know what I would suggest, I thought I had this thing last week, this COVID, I ponied myself. For two days, I got on my hands and knees. Sorry, I didn't mean to be crude. <laughs> but I wanted to, you know, I was frightened. I got on my hands and knees, I said, I don't want this. I won't do that again. All that stuff mm. again. I won't do this again. Lo and behold, I got the negative the following day. Mm. And then I, I, I was like a stuffed peacock. But the bottom line is, if you want to prepare yourself to, for death, I mean, who's ever out there preparing themselves, you know, seek the Lord and ask, repent and ask for forgiveness. He was close to death, this man. Mm. And what he claims is he came away from the hospital because he thought he was dying. This is back in, in the early days mm. when it first happened. He locked himself in his bedroom and then he agreed with, and they thought he was going to go. Then they, he agreed with the word of God, that God numbers our days. By all accounts, a few days later, he was, he was well. So if you've got this COVID, and I'm really sorry, I hope you don't die. If you're preparing yourself for death, 
the best thing to do is accept the Holy Spirit into your life mm. uh, and, and take it from there. Mm. I might be a bit mad, but that's the truth, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. For everyone who's listening, this is not a religious program. My book is not a religious book. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, what, whatever, wherever you look, there's gangsters, there's Jonathan, there's me, there's, there's everyone around. And, and I think the, the, the main objective of all this is if you're suffering, if you're in trouble, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, or whatever it is, money problems, family problems, then, then the suggestion is search. You haven't got to read the Bible. You haven't got to do anything. But if you're that pain that we all endure in our stomach here is what we need to heal. Yeah. So search, have a look, have a look at the now, have a look at whatever you need to have a look at other religions, but find a way to the truth. God bless. God bless. Great. Well, that's it. And um, thank you so much. And a massive thank you to Jonathan in particular for joining us. And um, do watch the space for future events. And the book is available on Waterstones, Amazon, etc. And we're also on social media. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jonathan.